The following program is made possible in part by Eaton's and Chrysler Canada and produced with the cooperation of the following companies. When we produced our first program on Canada, it was a major challenge to include every province and territory and to select certain cities, towns, parks, peoples and stories that would truly reflect its diversity. Well, now we have the opportunity to bring you more of this spectacular country. Please join me on top of the world on our second journey for this too is Canada. across Canada, we travelled from Nova Scotia to British Columbia using a different form of transportation, the train. Travelling by train allowed us the opportunity to stop en route and explore the beauty and scenic diversity of Canada as well as learn more about the history and culture of its peoples. in Halifax, the eastern seaport, where many immigrants first set foot. They arrived on ships. We landed by plane. Halifax is the gateway to the Atlantic provinces. Just a short plane trip away is the province of Newfoundland and Labrador with its wonderful history and culture, believed to be discovered first by the Vikings and later by Portuguese and English fishermen which led to the arrival of Italian explorer Giovanni Cabotto in the 15th century, better known as John Cabot. It's an even shorter trip by plane or ferry to Prince Edward Island, home of Anne of Green Gables, and Charlottetown, where the Fathers of Confederation had their historic meeting. Nova Scotia has a lot to offer. Fort Louisburg, the Cabot Trail that caused Alexander Graham Bell to remark that its incredible beauty was unsurpassed throughout the world. Peggy's Cove, a photographer's paradise where great granite boulders are strewn about and piled one upon another around a quaint rustic cove. Mahone Bay and Lunenburg, with their wonderful churches, fascinating architecture, and graveyards that yearn to tell tales of the early pioneers. En route to Blomenden Lookout, we stopped at Tidal View Farm to witness the natural phenomena of the tidal bore. The mouth of the Bay of Fundy between Yarmouth and Bar Harbor, Maine is 90 miles across. Between Digby and St. John, it's 45 miles across. And at Cape Split, it's five miles across. So you have all this water rushing in into a funnel-shaped bay, and it has nowhere to go but up. The same thing is happening here on this river, and the water is forcing up into a narrower river all the time, you see. And this is what creates a bore. When we first saw it coming around the bend, it was traveling approximately 10 miles an hour. The bore can be several feet high, and the lives of those who make their living from the sea is dictated by the tides that are amongst the highest in the world, sometimes reaching 15 meters. We traveled from Windsor through the Annapolis Valley and I was surprised to find that Nova Scotia had vineyards producing excellent local wines. And 
then we were on our way back to Halifax and heading for the train station to start our journey across Canada. Here in Atlantic Canada, the station was built by Canadian National Railways in 1930. Uh, as long as there has been passenger train service in Canada, there has been a connection between Montreal and Halifax. The Ocean Limited is the longest running passenger train in Canadian history. The Atlantic coast conjures up images of pounding seas and icy cold winds. The reality is sometimes very different. For example, in this province you'll find forests and seals and sand dunes. Welcome to New Brunswick. I love it. <laughs> 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 That's the way the Acadian does it. Yes. Mm. When you cook them, there's a salt kind of water left there. Mm. You can. Mm. Really good. Mm. Fantastic. <laughs> salt is enough. Oh, really good. There's so much within the province of New Brunswick. Certainly the, uh, the southeast uh, coast of New Brunswick, which has uh, the beaches and shorelines and the natural uh, habitats, which have gone relatively undiscovered for many, many years. And the reason Fujibaquack National Park was established to preserve uh, that part of Canada's heritage, uh, the barrier island system. Uh, it's basically uh, a nursery for uh, many of the, of the uh, fish and uh, small organisms that, that live along this coast and many of the birds and seals and, and other organisms uh, feed on. The dunes are a very fragile system and uh, it's uh, maintained by marum grass. The dunes also provides an ideal nesting area for the terns, but this year a major storm had destroyed their eggs. That was devastating and then they re-nested again and then uh, a little earlier in July we had another high sea and high winds and so that took out uh, two nests and so looking at this morning looks like they've nested a third time. The native people, the First Nations, fished in these waters and they camped along these coasts and they traveled and, and transported goods and supplies inland through the river systems. And then later came the Acadians who settled along the coast. In fact, the maritime provinces of Canada were once known as Acadia. Tantramar uh, was settled as early as 1672 by a gentleman named Jacques Bourgeois who came with five families. and. Um, the, the Acadian population of this area grew until, until the deportation in, in 1755. Acadia, as a colony of the, of the French, lived in a pretty much isolation. Um, there was uh, some administration from New France, but it was tenuous at best. So uh, the Acadians, I think, grew essentially neutral because of this isolation and, and relative spirit of independence. At Fort Beauséjour, Steve explained that caught between the ongoing British and French wars, the Acadians refused to take sides. But the British, unconvinced of their neutrality, deported them. The majority to the French colony of Louisiana, where they became known as Cajuns. Some of the Acadians managed to return to Canada, and at Le Pays de la Seguine, an interpretive centre and gigantic stage for the literary works of Antonine Meyer, I learnt more about their history. Et l'anga du docteur Chase pour toutes les maladies de la peau. Ni j'en ai pour tous les goûts. Et du sirop Lambert pour les coups de talène, les poumonniers et les cossons. Tiens! <rire> Tout ce qu'il faut pour les crochus, les tordus, les morveux, les esclopés. Qu'est-ce que vous voulez, mes petits cochons? Je crois que vous aimeriez ça avoir du pays, hein? Hey! Ça vous tenterait pas de prendre de large un beau matin pour les mers du Sud? 
they created Le Pays de la Saguine, a theme park for, to underline the, uh, the works of Antonin Maillet, which is an international Acadian author. Antonin Maillet uh, is a woman that's solidly connected to her roots, Acadian roots. And uh, it was more than just writing a story. It was an impulsion to transmit to the world, to the others, the existence of the Acadians, the Acadian culture, through the characters that she created. You don't erase history, but I've always felt that being part of that ethnic group, you know, uh, was good for me, and I have always been proud of it. And I've always appreciated the efforts that our great, great, great parents made to survive. And they have survived. New Brunswick is rich in Acadian culture. I ate Acadian food and attended an Acadian wedding. On the map, this little town appears somewhat inauspicious, but in fact, Matapedia has hosted kings and queens, prime ministers and presidents, dukes and duchesses. And it provides an entree in more ways than one. It is our entree to the province of Quebec, an entree to two great rivers, the Matapedia and Restigouche, and could well be an entree when we dine tonight, as some of the finest salmon in the world is caught here. Started at 12 year old. This is my 70th summer guiding. I've been guiding on the rest of this maybe 18 years or so and on the Medipedia for over 50 years. Most of the Americans came here first and built the camps over 100 years ago. I started out guiding the president of the IP, R.J. Cullen, John Hinman, this girl's father in law, and so on, and Jimmy Carter, and, and doctors and lawyers. We give them all the same service. If it's a girl, we give, them a, give her a few more smiles. <laughs> This is the Prince of Miguasha, the fossilized fish that allowed paleontologists to understand how the evolution from fish to amphibian took place. 370 million years ago in the Devonian period, when there were no amphibians, no reptiles or mammals, the transition from water to land occurred. And every stage of that remarkable development can be found here. It's a paleo ecosystem that has been preserved. We have the fish, we have the fern, we have the invertebrate, we have scorpions, we have water scorpions, we have traces of worms. So the whole ecosystem is buried in Miguasha. And it's only eight kilometers long. So can you imagine of all the surface of the earth, eight kilometers only of Miguasha, we comprehend how a fish evolved into a tetrapod. So we're still looking for an animal with a five-finger hand or even six-finger. I wouldn't mind the sixth one, but it has to have legs. Walking on land. The Perse Rock, a great block of limestone, rises 86 meters from the sea on the south shore of the Gaspé Peninsula. I watched from dawn to dusk as it revealed its many different faces to me and could understand why it has mesmerized and fascinated people since the early 18th century. Nearby, on Bonaventure Island, is the world's largest colony of gannets. We're talking about a bird brain, but a very smart bird brain. Yeah little computer knows exactly where it's, it's nesting along these, these 60,000 gannets. 
while they're flying in, they'll call, and the one that's sitting on the nesting site will answer. And for us, it's all the same, ra, 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 continually, but for them, it's different patterns of calling, so even the neighbor gets to, to know who's coming in. We left Per Se in those noisy gannets and headed for Parc National Forignon on the tip of the Gaspé Peninsula. We have a very popular event here that we've been uh, doing for uh, 17 years now. It brings people into contact, a direct contact with what's living in the sea in Forignon. We dive for the public who stays uh, on the beach and we go and pick up specimens. Uh, that uh, live uh, to about 100 meters from the shore and bring back uh, these specimens to aquaria that are on the beach. An aquarium for every, for every group. And uh, the naturalist there explains what uh, these animals are about and how they, how they mate and how they, how they eat and who preys on whom. <laughs> This is supposed to be a first-hand experience event, <laughs> people must realize. We feel it's our job to uh, build up an awareness that we don't know much about what's living in the sea around, uh, around our country. Most things that we know are just concerning the, uh, the species that we fish commercially, whereas all the rest of the wildlife has an importance also. we took the overnight train to North America's jewel of historic treasures, Quebec City. People don't realize this, but we share the name with Detroit, Michigan. Detroit is a French word that means a strait, an airwing of a waterway. And Quebec is Algonquin, and it means exactly the same thing, an airwing of a waterway. Actually, the narrowest point is from the bridges right down to the citadel here. Whoever controlled Quebec City controlled the entrance to North America. We started off here as a French settlement from 1608 till 1759. Now in 1759, the British took over the area. And then we went under a British rule until 1867. The city of Quebec is the only walled-in city in North America. Inside the walls, it's basically French. Because when the English took over the city, they helped the French rebuild the city the French way. The foundations were still there. But outside the walls, these were cornfields at the time. So the British built, but using their own influence in the architecture, a lot of Victorian style. You'll find the culture also in the restaurants here. There's a sidewalk cafes are very popular in the area. And it's part of the way of life of the, uh, the people here from Quebec. Perched on the heights of Cape Diamond, the impressive Chateau Frontenac looms above the oldest section of the city, Place Royale. The chateau was built in 1892 and was the first in a series of hotels built by CP railroads to promote tourism. Along with some modern embellishments, it still retains its original elegance and grandeur. Then it was back to the train and on to Ottawa via Montreal. This time, we had only a two and a half hour stopover, but it gave us just enough time to visit one of the highlights of this cosmopolitan city, Les Jardins Botaniques. Within the Japanese garden can be found an oasis of calm and a collection of rare beauty. The bonsai in this collection have been preserved for many generations and vary in age from 25 to 350 years. It was decided by Queen Victoria that this should become the capital. It was by town at the beginning, a lumber city, which has grown to be one of the great capital of the world. There are various ways to see Ottawa, but taking one of the many balloon excursions over the city was certainly a high point of our trip across Canada. The National Capital Region is uh, sitting uh, within the two provinces it touches on Quebec, it touches on Ontario, and I see the Ottawa River and the bridges that crosses 
uh, from uh, Quebec to Ontario, a link between both provinces. The development of Toronto owes much to the ingenuity of the many immigrants who settled here. 125 years ago, a young Irish boy, Timothy Eaton, proved to be one of the greatest entrepreneurs of his time. Timothy was the youngest in his family. Uh, he was born in 1834, and. Uh, his father died two months before he was born. The potato famines had uh, ravaged Ireland. There was a mass exodus of people looking for the new world. Timothy joined that group and came to Canada in about 1854. He moved to Toronto and finally, in 1869, bought Mr. Jennings' dry goods business in 178 Young and that's where the miracle began. Since we are 125 years uh, old, uh, birthdays, uh, once you're into this, are, are uh, wonderful things, wonderful memories. Uh, but we don't put our, all our eggs in the fact that we are 125 years and that we live in the past. The past is interesting, the past is fun. But we want to live into the future. It's the next 125 years that we look forward to and beyond. 20th century immigrants, the world famous Irish Rovers, started their singing career here in Toronto. Above a pub named for one of their greatest hits, the Unicorn, can be found a tribute to a great Canadian sports hero. We thought we'd build a Canadian sporting saloon. And looking for a hero, who did we find but an Irish Canadian hero? One whose record has not yet been beaten. 300 consecutive wins in the field of rowing. He came along just before the turn of the century. Ned Hanlon was his name. His father was an Irish innkeeper down there on Centre Island in Toronto. Hanlon's Point is named after Ned. So all around here you'll see pictures of Ned Hanlon and uh, if you read about his story, it was a, a, a very incredible um, record that he set. Dining, sports, shopping, arts, entertainment and the symphony, it's all here in Toronto. <laughs> One of the most urbanized regions in the world, Ontario is a vast province that dwarfs every nation in Europe. Its population lies huddled on the southern borders in modern towns and cities with steel, glass and concrete structures that pierce the skyline framing the northern fringes of the Great Lakes. Yet from here to the southern shores of Hudson's Bay, Ontario remains a wilderness with 90% of its area under forest. We left Toronto, the Canadian taking us north into the lakes and forests of the province, and then west to Lake Superior. It was a great opportunity to leave the train at Sioux Lookout and fly to Ontario's most northerly community, Fort Seven. Bearskin Airlines is a remarkable service that helps to maintain communication between many of the small native communities that exist in the north. It is the plane that brings fresh produce on a regular basis, whilst the tankers come in once or twice during the summer months with gas and heavy equipment. Although goose hunting is popular at this time of year, ecotourism is a developing market for the native peoples, and travelers like myself are coming up in hopes of filming polar bears and rare species of birds on their migratory routes through Hudson's Bay. We have guiding and all that too. That's one thing they do. Uh, they also would have a boat and uh, also they would have a ground transportation. But this time that you, you would see uh, a lot of polar bears, a lot of geese and caribou and birds. 
seals. We flew south to Thunder Bay. Lake Superior is the world's largest freshwater lake, and from the late 17th century, it was the canoe route of the voyageurs and fur traders. From 1803 to 21, Fort William, as it was then known, was the inland headquarters of the Northwestern Company, where colonial agents, Indians, and trappers gathered to exchange furs for trading goods during the great rendezvous. Nowadays, this event is reenacted for the tourists. But you don't have to live in the past. Thunder Bay is a modern city, the third largest port in Canada, and the world's largest grain handler. It is also the place where, sadly, Terry Fox was forced to give up his courageous run for cancer. Diamond Willow is one of the many amethyst mines in the area. If you get a nice blue chunk or a nice purple, and you got a good piece. And some of the people now are going for the ones that are covered with hematite, the brown ones. And they usually have bigger points. And it makes beautiful rings and earrings, necklaces. And then you get the bigger rough stuff for fireplaces and walls. Thunder Bay is also home to Kakabeka Falls, the Niagara of the North. Whilst Big Thunder draws ski jumping enthusiasts from around the world. I'm walking on or even underneath water and 14,000 years ago that would have been accurate because at that time this whole region was covered by the world's largest freshwater lake, Lake Agassiz. It was formed by the glaciers as they retreated. Well the main lake dried up about eight or nine thousand years ago but it left a legacy of smaller lakes including Lake Winnipeg and an incredibly rich and fertile soil, the prairies. When I came to Manitoba, I expected to see flat land stretching endlessly to the horizon. Instead, I found rolling prairies, forests, wet marshlands, and incredibly colorful valleys. Uh, okay, McMarsh was uh, one of the first drainage districts in Western Canada. Uh, then in the early 70s, Ducks Unlimited and the Department of Natural Resources got together and uh, decided to rebuild, restore a portion of the former marsh that had existed here. And they also built a number of nesting islands to provide some safe areas for birds to nest. Uh, wetlands are second only to rainforests in the amount of um, biological diversity that they contain. Our visit to Gimli coincided with Islandinga Dagurin, a celebration of Icelandic heritage. Nearly 125 years ago, following a devastating volcanic eruption in their homeland, Icelandic immigrants settled in Gimli and Hekla on Lake Winnipeg. The first Icelanders came here uh, to settle as colonists in 1875. 
When they arrived in late October in open barges, it was already snowing and a winter storm was brewing. The steamship Coldwell had managed to tow them here to Willow Point on Lake Winnipeg. The blizzard worsened and the captain told them they must turn back or they would all perish. And uh, they were totally in disagreement with them. They argued with them for some two hours and then finally he chopped the rope and let them go. They came to an absolute total wilderness. There was nothing but trees and swamp. Despite the adverse conditions, they survived. And today's Islandin Gadagurin is an annual event celebrating the strength and character of those early pioneers. At Spruce Woods Provincial Park, 11,000-year-old spear tips have been found dating back to the Clovis culture and a people who hunted the now extinct giant bison and mammoth. It was first used by native people um, hundreds of years ago. And then after that, with the uh, dawn of the fur trade, it became a popular place for, uh, for fur traders to use at the, at the junction of the Epinet and the Assiniboine River. We have a healthy population of beaver, which uh, is part of the reason for the fur trade. The spirit sands, uh, they were first formed about 18,000 years ago when uh, the river draining into glacial Lake Agassiz um, left the deposits of sand and then as the lake receded the sands was still well above the uh, surrounding water and it first began uh, getting colonized by plants such as uh, spruce and tamarack and, uh, and then grasses and, but it's the sands themselves that make it unique. Brandon, Manitoba's second largest city, sprang up from the prairie after being chosen in 1881 as CPR's first divisional point west of Winnipeg. From 1939 to 45, British, Australian, New Zealand and Canadian air personnel came to Brandon, Manitoba to train as part of the Allied Air Forces here at the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. It was called Canada's greatest single contribution to the Allied victory in World War II. Now a museum, this authentic wartime hangar displays artifacts and memorabilia from these years. There's 14 aircraft on display as well as uniforms, uh, you know, all other kinds of memorabilia, photographs, etc. Back on board the Canadian, dinner was being served. This is your second call for dinner in the dining car. C'est votre deuxième appel pour le dîner dans la salle de restaurant. We arrived in Saskatoon in the early hours of the morning, but this time we were on our way to northern Saskatchewan. We need an enrichment other than material prosperity, and to gain it, we only have to look around at what our country has to offer. We have here something that no other country has. Those were the words of the colorful, controversial conservationist Grey Owl, who lived here in what is now Prince Albert National Park in the province of Saskatchewan. You know, one of those flat prairie provinces. A lot of people think it's just gophers and prairie out here. But see, we live on the second of, or the, just half of the province, and it's all beautiful lakes, resorts, a lot of great fishing. And I would say there's no place around nicer than Saskatchewan. I started with New York, and then I went to uh, Montreal Canadiens, and then I went to Minnesota, the first year of the expansion. And that, that was kind of a great moment, because we made the playoffs that year, and we almost went to the Stanley Cup. And, the money I made that year, I bought a nice cabin here in Waskasu. Never been a captain, but I've been a captain on that boat for the last 12 years or so. I talked about Gray Owl. I just look at the amount of water he had to paddle his canoe to get home and back and forth. Gray Owl, a famous conservationist who shared his cabin with two pet beaver but who became notorious for practicing what was ultimately one of the greatest deceptions of his time, even managing to fool British and European royalty. The greater public certainly was of, uh, of that mind, that he was a, a half-breed Indian, um, and that he was coming from the, the wilds of Canada to tell this story. He was really an Englishman. His name was Archibald Bellany from Hastings, England. Uh, when he emigrated to Canada as a young man, he uh, 
embarked on a complete transition of his lifestyle from a young, well-to-do Englishman into a half-breed bushman. In short, he became a conservationist rather than a hunter and a trapper. And um, he became very famous for his books and his films and his lecture tours, inspiring people about the beauty of the Canadian wilderness and the need to protect that. Grey Owl died in 1938 and was buried on the shores of Ajuan Lake in Prince Albert National Park, where his cabin still stands to this day. This park was established in 1927 uh, in a transition zone between the prairies and aspen parkland and the boreal forest of uh, what is a really central Saskatchewan. Fungi just never get enough credit for their role in, in, the, in the ecosystem, and I'm glad that we're spending a few extra moments to take a look at them. It's so important in the cycle of decomposition and, and, and really some nutrients and things. Some of them can come up through the ground virtually overnight. You know, it doesn't take you know, 24, 48 hours maybe for them to pop. And what we're looking at is just the fruiting body, just the reproductive structures. What's really amazing, and we'll never get a footage of it. I, um, are all the fungal fingers that spread out underneath the forest floor and link this forest with the rest of the, um, the organisms. We've got small wood, smaller woodpeckers like um, blackback woodpeckers and three-toed woodpeckers that will search the bark and flick off pieces of it with their bills and then they'll feed on the insects underneath. It's a mature trembling aspen, probably around 70 or 80 years, something like that, for this growing site. And um, obviously they fell it to, and it just happened to end up in the creek bed. And uh, as you can see, they've cut off the upper branches, they've topped the tree after it's been down. They'll use those upper branches for the dam and the lodge, and the smaller branches and leaves, of course, they'll use as feed, either incorporating them into the dam or lodge, or probably into a food raft for the winter time. There are many greater reasons, I believe, in, that national parks are established. Maybe Gray all summed it up. He said, I bring you what? A single green leaf. His single green leaf was a symbol of that tremendous variety of, of wilderness and nature that in our day-to-day -day lives we seem, we seem to forget or lose touch with. And I hope that that doesn't happen in places like national parks. This country has experienced four major ice ages. In Alberta, the most westerly of Canada's three prairie provinces, the Athabasca Glacier and Columbia Ice Field once formed part of an enormous ice sheet that crowned and carved the landforms you see behind me here in the Rocky Mountains. At one time, the Athabasca Glacier flowed north to the present site of Jasper and then joined up with other glaciers that flowed east to the prairies and south past Calgary. And the Columbia Ice Field itself is a, just over 100 square miles. And it is the mother of all rivers because it does flow into or creates water for three different rivers. The Saskatchewan, the Columbia, and the Athabasca. And each of those rivers flow into three different oceans. So it is a hydrological center of North America. Uh, with the Saskatchewan flowing eventually into uh, Hudson's Bay, the Athabasca into the Arctic, and the Columbia into the Pacific. The tours on the Athabasca Glacier began in the late 40s with the highways close to the glacier. People can come here by motor coach, by car. We have 13 uh, 56 passenger multi-tired uh, multi 
ter all-terrain vehicles, they're called. We call it the snow coach. It's actually made in Calgary by a Canadian company. We take them out onto the surface of the glacier. And that's something that most people don't get a chance to do ever. actually arrived in Edmonton, the capital of Alberta, a couple of days earlier and had taken the traditional city tour. It was when we were filming the Houses of Parliament that I chanced on these archaeological students from the university digging on the original site of Fort Edmonton. There was a West Warehouse put in after 1860 and that's what we're, we're investigating. In the 12 weeks that we've been digging, we've come up with over 14,000 artifacts from the site, ranging from pieces of, of bone to little tiny trade beads and ceramics. It's really wonderful and it's great to be, to be doing part of Edmonton's history. It opened in May of 1974 as a result of Edmontonians who wanted to preserve their history and so Fort Edmonton Park is actually a representation of four periods of time from 1846 when we had a Hudson's Bay fur trading post and then our streets of 1885, 1905 and 1920 and we try to recreate life as it would have been. with a number of my supplies. car that you just saw go by has actually been in operation since 1908 so it's a real treasure to us and cars and trucks have been donated to us model a's uh, we have the edmonton's first uh, tour bus is, is here with us in the park so there's a multitude of things that have been restored generally through volunteer support between the 1890s and 1930s almost a quarter of a million ukrainians settled in this east central part of alberta and this is the history that we show We've moved over 30 buildings, including homes, businesses, churches, um, a school, from towns and farms in this part of Alberta. We've moved them here, restored them to what they looked like in that time period, and we have uh, role players, people in costume, that portray the actual pioneers. I, I think it's a fascinating history. Um, my great-grandparents came to Canada and I heard the stories when I was younger about living in a clay and log house with a clay oven inside. And I, I find that senior citizens appreciate it as well because they can say, oh, you know, I remember that. And they explain to their grandchildren how it might have worked. Elk Island started out in 1906 as Canada's first wildlife refuge for large mammals, specifically the elk and uh, we have a, a large plains bison herd as well. Right now, we're in the middle of their mating season. The bulls engage in, in, in displays one to another to establish dominance. Eventually, a pecking order of bulls is established and, and, and of course the dominant animal um, has the breeding privileges, but he's not above being challenged. And, and if he's gathering a harem, it takes a lot of his time and energy to, to keep this harem together. Um, and he's kept from feeding and all that sort of thing. So he becomes very irritable. But for 80 years, Elk Island was, uh, was a place where fire didn't occur. Or if it did occur, it was an all-out battle to stop it. Whether it was from a lightning strike or from uh, a careless camper, um, we, f we put out every fire. And in this environment that at one time was, was uh, woodland and, and open prairie meadow, uh, we now have a closed forest. In order to restore the habitats and natural diversity of the park, fire was reintroduced into the ecosystem, pushing back the aspen forest and allowing the native species to regain their foothold.
Jasper National Park is part of the Rocky Mountain ecosystem. It protects many wildlife species, and since the animals are not being hunted, they can often be seen by the roadside. People are running across the highways with their cameras and also approaching wildlife too close to them. They'll want a picture of their, their family or their children in front of a, a bear or an elk. And uh, these animals are extremely dangerous and unpredictable and they feel threatened uh, and you get too close to their space and uh, you, can, you can be injured. And over 100 animals get killed annually from people who did not obey the speed limit signs. So please pick up the guidelines on viewing wildlife and other park activities from the park warden's offices. It would protect the wildlife, it would protect the people themselves and they would have a much more enjoyable holiday if they would just get that information and, and follow the guidelines. At the end of that valley, you'll see the Yellowhead Range going across. The Yellowhead Range is named for a Métis guide who is part Iroquois and part French. Although the purpose of the railway was primarily to link the provinces and ensure their commitment to confederation, it was perhaps William Van Horn who can be credited with recognizing the railway's potential in tourism. When he saw the Canadian Rockies, he vowed, if we can't export the scenery, we'll import the tourists. And he did. The Rockies are frequently referred to as the jewel in the crown, and people come from all over the world to experience this awe-inspiring section of track, winding its way through a complex jumble of mountain ranges that provide the gateway to British Columbia. To witness this incredible natural phenomena in daylight, we had boarded the Rocky Mountaineer at Jasper, and we were now cruising along the tracks on a two-day tour in a luxury sightseeing train. The river, highways, railways, mountains and rangelands all come together at Kamloops, a natural crossroads and meeting place, and the oldest city in the province. Head to the hills at night and enjoy dining with the stars above and the twinkling lights of the city far below. It's a magical experience. Next day, we were back on the train and heading to Vancouver with the Fraser River, Hell's Gate, canyons, bald eagles and rare views of osprey nests on the itinerary.
I think the thing that's unique about Vancouver is uh, the setting uh, that we see, the mountains and the parks, lots of attractions that uh, are good for all ages, like the Capilina Suspension Bridge, um, Grouse Mountain, Seymour Mountain, some of the uh, canyon areas. Because we have such a mild climate, um, it offers a lot of these things on a year-round basis. We have our um, historic gas town, which is where Vancouver started out in the early uh, 1880s. And uh, we have uh, the Museum of Anthropology, which is um, perhaps one of the finest uh, West Coast Indian um, art exhibit areas. I always tell people the, the nice thing about Stanley Park is that you can put on your hiking boots in the morning and go hiking alone in, in the forest and watch a very civilized cricket game for lunch and take your family on a cycle around the seawall in the afternoon and have an elegant dinner at one of the restaurants in the evening. The zoo has an interesting history. It dates back to the 1890s, but uh, over the years they have been phasing out the exotic, more exotic animal section of the zoo, and they're, they're focusing more on uh, rehabilitation and conservation of local endangered species. Uh, we're the major gateway for all of the uh, trains and motor coaches going to the Canadian Rockies. And then on a more local basis, where you can get uh, very quickly to Vancouver Island, Victoria, or up to the Sunshine Coast, uh, or into the northern part of British Columbia through any of the rail routes or highway routes. So we're, we're really the, the hub for everything that happens in British Columbia. Both mountains, Whistler Mountain and Blackwell Mountain, run their lifts and gondolas uh, through the whole summer. So people can actually have a mountain experience in a very comfortable way. The city, the, the meadows, the alpine meadows, you may see some wildlife in it. You may be lucky and see a bear. Uh, winter skiing, of course, is the great thing. Uh, Cross-country skiing, snowmobiling, um, ice sailing, you name it. Again, all these activities are in Whistler. For me, the key really is not only uh, that we have got great skiing, great accommodation, but that we very early recognized how important the greenness of the valley is, how important the, the natural setting of Whistler is, and we managed to preserve that, that natural setting. Victoria has always been thought of as a retirement place where older people went to spend the rest of their days. But in the last 10 years, Victoria has become, I think, one of the most vital cities in Canada. A visit to Victoria, the capital city of British Columbia, would not be complete without afternoon tea at the world-famous Empress Hotel. Fabulous, thank you. Absolutely magnificent. And these are butter tarts with the raisins. A train journey across Canada can be accomplished in just a few days, but by taking the time to stop and explore the provinces as we did, it had taken us six weeks. And once again I was left with the knowledge that there is so much more to this country, more to see, more to do and more to explore. Take time to head off the beaten track as we did, challenge the myths and the stereotypes and marvel at the different moods and majesty of Canada. I'm Anne Martin and I'll see you again next time on Top of the World.
would like to follow in our footsteps, the following bonus travel guide has been provided to help you plan your Canadian vacation. The categories are transportation, accommodation, and tourism toll-free telephone numbers for every province and territory. Airline transportation was provided by Canada 3000 Airlines, with frequent service to major centers across Canada, Europe, and to the Caribbean. Contact your travel agent for further information. Bearskin Airlines services the smaller northern communities of Ontario and Manitoba. Train service is available with meals and overnight accommodation where applicable, coast to coast, on Via Rail. We traveled on the Ocean Limited in the Eastern Sector, the Via 1 Corridor Service, and the Canadian on the Western Sector. For further information, contact your local Via Rail office or your travel agent. The Great Canadian Railroad Company provides a scenic tour on the Rocky Mountaineer from Jasper and Calgary to and from Vancouver. Call this toll-free telephone number for further information. Special excursions in which we participated included Capitaine Duval for our catamaran tours in Per Se, Cross Canada Balloons for our Ottawa trip, Winnisk Air in Fort Severn, Brewster Tours on the Athabasca Glacier, and the Jasper Tramway. Accommodation was provided by the following hotels. For specific information on every province and territory in Canada, please call the following tourism toll-free telephone numbers, valid for Canada and the United States, unless otherwise indicated. This program was produced in cooperation with Chrysler Canada. AT&T and NCR and is presented in celebration of Eaton's 125th anniversary. Further copies of this video in either North American or European formats along with our first Canadian special are available in Eaton's or by calling toll-free 1-800-661-1674 in Canada or 1-800-441-9501 in the USA. Educational institutes should write to the producer at this address.